continue. Thank you very much for coming back. Thank you for your continued interest. And the second part of this evening's uh, uh, presentation will be on hazard mitigation and how we monitor volcanoes. And in addition, I will talk a little bit about the positive sides of volcanoes because personally I think volcanoes, as most of us as well, have good sides and bad sides, like humans, like most things. And uh, we want to harvest the good sides, we want to stay away from the bad sides. So, here is a postcard I also bought in the US, and uh, this is the city of Seattle, and just in the backdrop of Seattle, some 20 odd kilometers away, is Mount Rainier. <coughs> Mount Rainier is one of the big friends of Mount St. Helens, it's a very similar type of volcano to Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier can erupt. The uh, colleagues in America have looked at the volcano very carefully and they argue one side of the volcano is not very stable. It might actually experience a similar fate to Mount St. Helens 1980. Only Mount St. Helens didn't have any big cities in its near or direct surrounding. This is different from Mount Rainier. I don't want to even imagine what would be happening in Seattle if this volcano erupts on a large scale. And uh, the American colleagues really need to be well prepared for these things, and I trust they are. And the volcano is extensively monitored for exactly that purpose. There's people watching the volcano every day of the year. So, volcanic hazards and what we can do about it, the mitigation. And by the way, we try to get rid of this black spot. Very sorry, it's uh, some some of the, um, um, the background things in the screen that seem to be broken, there's not much I can do about it, so we have to leave it. But it's obvious that we have no tools to stop volcanoes, so we can only attempt to understand them and stay away from the dangerous episodes of volcanoes. We generally need to monitor volcanoes on a long term because volcanoes have a different life cycle to humans. It's over thousands of years, not over tens of years like our life cycle. So we need to really put effort into monitoring volcanoes. And this is often pretty well done in the Western world. But because of funding, because of financial aspect, it's not as well developed in lesser developed countries. This is part of the reason why there's more fatalities in, for example, third world countries because volcanoes are not that well monitored there. I will give you an example later on. I think scientists are pretty good by now to tell when volcanoes can erupt, but uh, if it's not monitored, we cannot tell, and that's a huge shortcoming. So, we have to go back a little bit, and uh, one of the first volcano observatories that was really in action for long term was the observatory at Vesuvio, and it was established in 1871. So you can see the building to the top left and Vesuvius in the background. And back in those days, it was effectively a scientist with some binoculars or so watching the volcano. And whenever there was some activity, he would give alert. Today, we're using a whole array of technical help. And uh, this tells us a lot about the volcano. So in the early days, it was really just watching it and uh, reporting if there was anomalous activity. But for that, to assess whether you have anomalous activity, you need to check what is the normal activity. You need to have a background behavioral check before you can say this is anomalous or this is dangerous. So for this, we need to monitor these things long term. Here's a few impressions of the old building. It's now a museum. It's no longer operational, but I visited a few years ago and you can still go there. Nowadays, everything is in a larger building, which is all computerized, but uh, this makes a nice little excursion on a Sunday afternoon if you're really interested in volcanoes. So, volcano monitoring, it requires professional and systematic work on volcanoes. First of all, what geologists do, they look at the rocks, they map the area, and then they predict what areas are dangerous and what areas are not dangerous. What we also do is we check the seismicity. It's like the pulse of the volcano. Is there earthquakes? Is there more earthquakes than there used to be? Is there less earthquakes? This will tell us something. 
It's the intensity of earthquakes changing. Another one is the tilt or deformation. Are the flanks of the volcano bulging out or not? We can nowadays measure this with GPS, with uh, satellite instruments, for example, and uh, <clears throat> we know reasonably well whether there is deformation at a flank of a volcano or not. We can also look at the gas flux and whether the chemistry of the gases changes. Often if we have more sulfur coming out with the gas, it's a good chance that there is new magma arriving. And this is giving us an indication. If the gas gets hotter, this is also a good indication that there may be fresh magma in the volcano. Then the temperature in general. I've just talked to uh, someone outside and the person was saying at Hekla in Iceland they get a good idea where the volcano is becoming active due to the water disappearing. And indeed, if it gets hotter, the water will evaporate from crater lakes or rivers close to the volcano, and this can be an indication as well. And uh, then there is all sorts of other effects, like the magnetics will change, the electric resistivity will change, and there are some very old-style methods, like the animals will move away. They're smarter in this concept than most of us, so they know when something is getting unpleasant. They can smell it in the air, and they can feel the shaking of the ground. They're not magic. They're just having senses that uh, are well tuned in for these phenomena. And uh, once you see animals moving away, like at Merapi, I've seen it once, that when the volcano is active, the monkeys move out, move out of the jungle. So they know this is not pleasant. And uh, so these are all indications we can take to understand volcanoes better. So here's the first example, that's the mapping. And I showed this example a little while ago. This was Amero in um, South America. Nevada del Ruiz erupted 1985. And the mapping was entirely correct. The hazard areas were correctly identified, but it wasn't implemented. So the problem is not just that we can uh, understand, uh, that we can find the evidence, we also need to create societal structures for implementation of these things. Otherwise, understanding it is not the best use. Here, a few kind of simple <coughs> sketches on these other phenomena, seismicity, the tilt, and the gas emission, and uh, then also heat flow. So we need a team of specialists, of scientists who monitor these things on a almost 24 seven on a full time basis and they must be ready to give alarm. And once there is an alarm, we must have procedures in place. We must know what to do. We must have places where refugees can go, where they will be taken care of. There must be supplies for them. So if you live in a volcanic area, the um, municipalities, they need to have real measures in place to cope with these things. There was um, a big eruption in uh, Indonesia in 2014. Uh, it was on Valentine's Day, this is why I remember it so well. And uh, the eruption resulted in uh, the evacuation of 80,000 people within something like two hours. It's a huge logistical task and feat to accomplish this. Some people did die after all, but this was more from accidents on the roads and things like that. So even places like Indonesia in Southeast Asia, which is by no means on our standard in terms of development, they have gone pretty good at evacuations and having these things in place. So this is very important. You need to be prepared. It's not something you can just do. So, seismicity. This is measuring earthquakes, the shaking of the ground. And I'm not a seismologist, but uh, here's some old uh, seismometer. And uh, you know this all from movies. Once the needle goes really crazy, then you know there are some big earthquakes happening. And this is what we measure. If your earthquakes get more intense, this is getting more serious. Here is a plot from the USGS. Here's the number of earthquakes per day over a certain period. And uh, here you see, this was in this case March 13th to 22nd. And the number of earthquakes got really crazy here. And that's a good indication that something is not right. That's a good time for thinking about, hmm, maybe we want to evacuate soon. Another thing people do is uh, 
measuring of the tilt of flanks, and you can do this with laser, or nowadays we can do it with uh, satellites. You don't have to actually go there anymore. So the volcano tends to grow bigger, <coughs> tends to bulge out once we have an impeding eruption, and it often sinks down in itself a little bit once the eruption has stopped. So you can actually start to get a feeling for when the eruption might get less strong once the flanks are moving in again. And as I said, these days we're doing this with radar measures. So this is a technology uh, called radar interferometry. And here the satellite that flies over a certain place like a volcano takes images every so often. And once you overlay them, then you get these interferograms and they tell you how much deformation you have. So here is change in millimeters, and uh, you will find that certain areas deform more strongly than others. And if this reaches a certain threshold, you can give alert, and you can start to evacuate people. Monitoring of uh, gas and temperature is very important. This is uh, in Indonesia. At Papandayan volcano, I have a piece of sulfur outside. This is from this place. And in this particular case, the fumarole that was uh, giving off gas here was 211 degrees hot. And uh, if you <coughs> go there every day and measure this, and you would find that, oh, now it's 350, the next day it's 400, that would give you a serious indication that something is happening there. This is from the peak of Merapi volcano, also in Indonesia. And uh, here we start with gas in quite an elaborate effort. And then once you have the gas in a little container, you can bring it to the laboratory and analyze it. And if you do this once a month or so, you will get a baseline. And if you have any variations on the baseline, that's good indication that something might be happening at the volcano sooner or later. You can do this not just on the volcano, you can also do this in uh, water, in streams or lakes, in the surrounding of volcano. There is a volcano that erupted 12,000 years ago in Germany, in the Eiffel region, and uh, we still have CO2 bubbles in the crater lakes. And that means there's still magma somewhere at depth, and uh, <coughs> if you want you can analyze this. So this gentleman here is taking water from a little well, and uh, he's going to analyze it for chemistry. And if the chemistry is changing over time, that's a good indication that something is not right. Down here, we have now measurements with uh, airplanes or drones. You can fly over volcanoes. And here's the flight path in kilometers. And uh, here's the crater of a volcano, and there the sulfur emissions are particularly strong and the CO2 as well, and further <coughs> from the volcano it goes away. So nowadays, with erupting volcanoes, we don't go there to sample. We have remote instruments, making the whole business a lot more safe. And uh, we more and more fall back on remote sensing. In this case here, from Merapi in Indonesia, there's some radar or satellite uh, measurements. And there we see that in the crater area, suddenly there were anomalies, in this case on the 28th of April in 2006. That's the 2006 eruption, which I mentioned before. And the different colors give different temperatures. And uh, here, the, the, the idea is that the temperature is starting to increase in the crater area. And that's a good indication that something might be happening. Here's another example, Mayon in the Philippines also from 2006, and uh, here again, this is radar data, and you see the anomaly, the heat anomalies, they are recorded in the crater area, in the summit area of the volcano, and uh, once this happens, you get an idea that this volcano might be preparing for a large eruption. We can also track ash clouds. Um, you I'm sure remember the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2010 that uh, was responsible for the closure of much of northern Europe's airspace. I was with 30 students in France and I was completely stuck because they also had a railway strike at the same time. So uh, I remember the adventure of trying to get back and uh, we managed but with a substantial delay. But uh, people Scientists have gone a lot better. This is Etna in Italy in 2001. And here you see an ash cloud. It's transported by the wind. You also see some lava flows. And 
you can actually get an idea of where this ash might be traveling to. And this might be useful. If you have people downwind here with respiratory problems, they can prepare. They can start to move out of the area, they can start to close their windows or put their gas masks on or things like that. So <laughs> preparation is the key aspect here. We need to be ready for these events and we need to be able to say what exactly might be happening. Here's an example of an ash cloud that's been traveling. This was um, from the Spore volcano in Alaska. It's not a particularly well-known volcano. It's very remote. It's the red dot in the top left. And this ash cloud was traveling and it was swirling around with the winds and it ended up somewhere in northern Canada. Low population density, no big problem. But in these areas down here, in the northern US for example, or southern Canada, these areas, they were more seriously affected. There you might need to warn people over radio and television that ash clouds or gas clouds are coming. And uh, what we often find is that it affects the most vulnerable of the society. It affects people who are either particularly young or particularly old and often have breathing problems. And uh, there we find that these situations actually increase the death toll of those cases in, quite a, in some areas quite dramatically in case of active eruptions. I said earlier that we have reason for hope. And uh, scientists are getting better at predicting volcanic eruptions. So, Mount St. Helens had a rather not so well-known eruption two years after the big 1980 eruption. And the 1980 eruption was a bit of an embarrassment for the uh, American Geological Survey because they didn't fully understand all the things that were going on. So they put enormous effort into understanding volcanoes. And the 1982 eruption is so little known because nothing bad happened. And here we have seismicity, and sorry the yellow curve is blocked out by this black bar, but you get the idea. And uh, here we have the dates. This was in March of that year. And uh, up to about the 19th of um, March when the eruption occurred, people were able to see all oh, the seismicity was increasing. The dome expansion was also increasing. Tilting of the flanks was increasing. And right after the eruption, the flanks went down again. I said earlier, they rise and go down. So immediately after the eruption, the flanks were subsiding a little. And sulfur emission was also very strong and it was increasing. And indeed, because of all these phenomena pointing towards an active eruption, the eruption was successfully predicted. The eruption was predicted within uh, a short while of it actually happening, everybody was evacuated in the area, no fatalities, and uh, nothing really happened. So, the good news is we can predict eruptions, provided that we monitor with sufficient detail, with efficient equipment, and with the right manpower. This is not cheap, this is very expensive, but it can be done. And this means Cool, there's hope. There's hope in areas that have high population density around volcanoes, and uh, there's a good reason why many countries like Indonesia have particularly high population density close to volcanoes. It's because the soil is very good. Agriculture is very good there. People have more harvests close to volcanoes than further away, so it's attractive for people to go there. That's why we need to understand how volcanoes operate. So, now I'd like to come to the last part of my presentation, and that is the good sides of volcanoes. Volcanoes are not all bad. And when I was a little boy, I remember that my mom told me about volcano eruptions in Italy. And I went to bed, and I was really worried, and said, will, will I be affected? Will the lava come? And my mom said, no, 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 no. There's huge mountains in between. The lava cannot come over. So. I, I, I grew up in this belief that volcanoes are dangerous and bad, but it's not entirely so. There is, as I just said, volcanic ash that is harmful when erupted, but it's very good for agriculture. Volcanic ash has a lot of nutrients and it allows to grow a lot of things. Let me stress, over 70% of coffee is grown on volcanic soil. So if you drink your cup of coffee tomorrow morning, you may think of this. Most of it has grown on volcanic material. 
Then, volcanic geothermal energy is very important. We are getting better at harvesting this, and this is relatively clean energy. <coughs> uh, the Indonesians are starting huge projects now to try to harvest this, to become less reliant on fossil fuels. Um, New Zealand is very good at this. Iceland is very good at this. In fact, believe it or not, Iceland has the highest banana production in Europe. You wouldn't think of Iceland being a place for growing bananas, but in the greenhouses that are heated by geothermal energy, this is where it's possible. So, volcanic rocks are also very good for building. We have a long tradition of using volcanic materials to create buildings, and I'll show some examples in a minute. And not to forget, many of our ore deposits, many of our metals come from volcanoes. And uh, with a little bit of pride, I'm going to tell you now that I got an email yesterday saying that I got an article accepted in a very prestigious uh, journal, and uh, the article is about Kiruna. And uh, I'm proposing in this article that Kiruna has formed under a volcano. And the article will now be published. So, I believe, and maybe there's other opinions out there as well, but I believe there was a big Kiruna volcano a long time ago here in Sweden and it produced the ore that is now so vital for Sweden's economy. So, they have also an added benefit because, as Mr. Darwin said, volcanoes produce the most beautiful scenery in the world. <laughs> so, there is also an uplifting aspect to this, and I'll talk about the, some of these examples now in the last part of my presentation. So, you probably know about this, Obsidian, and I have a sample outside, has been one of the main and first tools for humans in order to make arrowheads, spearheads, because once it breaks, it's very sharp. And there is a lot of surgeons today that still prefer obsidian blades to metal blades because they're sharper. So, in societies without metal, this was the way to create cutting tools. And humans have been very good in exploiting this. So without volcanic eruptions, this would not have been possible. So we must be aware that taking the skin of a bear or so requires a cutting tool. And we wouldn't have been able to settle in areas where it's particularly cold without having these tools. So we must realize that we have only expanded over the planet to the degree we see today because of being able to exploit these resources. Another aspect that I think is very important is exploration. Volcanoes have been vital for navigation. One of the key examples here is Tele Volcano in Tenerife. And this is a Dutch drawing from 17-something. I forgot exactly what the year is. Of course, the volcano is ex exaggerated. It's much bigger on this drawing than it really is relative to the little ship here. Um, but it was such a big volcano that the seafarers was, were seeing it in distance. And it allowed them to navigate their way towards the south of Africa or later on also to uh, the south of America. And here's a few more impressions of Pico de Tede and all the ships in the surrounding of Tenerife, which was a major port area back then for the trade with the Americas, for example. I mentioned this before, agriculture, volcanic soil is really, really good at Mount Merapi in Indonesia, people close to the volcano have three harvests a year. Further away from the volcano, they only have two harvests. It's that dramatic. So going close to the volcano is attractive. And uh, this is tobacco plants. It's very good for tobacco growth. I stopped smoking several years ago, but I still remain, uh, I still like this picture because you see the tobacco plants and uh, Nowadays, people use tobacco not just for smoking, they uh, make medication of it, and it's good for medical treatments, for skin and all that. So tobacco will still be grown there for a long time, I'm sure. And uh, volcanic soil is especially good for it, as it is for coffee. This is coffee beans, also from Indonesia. And uh, many of the big coffee plantations are within volcanic craters or on the flanks of volcanoes. Volcanic soil is particularly good for coffee. So I think I mentioned it, 75%, about 75% of coffee is actually grown on volcanic soil. Hmm. Building material. We have been building with volcanic rock for a long time. 
Here's some classic examples. This is from Germany, this is from France, and uh, particularly pumice type rock, which has a lot of bubbles. It's very light. We can easily work it. You can chisel it very easily. It's very insulating because of the bubbles, and it makes a beautiful building material. So volcanic rocks have been used for a long time, but we also find that basalt was used, for example, as cobblestone in streets because it's very durable. Pumice wouldn't be very good for this, but basalt is very good for this. So we have been using volcanic rocks for building purposes for a long while. Here's some more impressions from France in this case. So this is from Clermont um, in uh, the southeast of France. And uh, here is an old castle that is also in the area of Clermont. And all of these materials, oh, sorry, all of these buildings were built from volcanic material in the area. I mentioned ores, and indeed, many of our ores go back to volcanic phenomena. We have uh, copper, gold, silver, lead, diamonds come from volcanic rocks as well. Most of our iron comes there, phosphorus, we can mine sulfur there. And, uh, Many of them have volcanic origin. So, Sweden is the number one producer for iron within the European Union. And as I just tried to convince you, I think most of the iron in Sweden comes from volcanoes. <laughs> so, here's just a few more impressions. Here's some sulfite deposits uh, in a volcanic situation, in this case from China. And uh, here we have a sulfur mine in Indonesia. And uh, both places I visited over the last few years. So we really must accept that many of our resources have a volcanic origin. I mentioned geothermal energy, and uh, here is uh, a picture of the Wairaki power plant in this, uh, New Zealand, in the North Island of New Zealand. And uh, there's other ones in Indonesia, in New Zealand, etc. And here we can harvest the steam as well as the heat and it's used for district heating, it's also used for creating electricity, and here's a little idea of how such a power plant works. We often pump water close to the magma reservoir, the water gets heated up, like in a steam engine, and then it drives a turbine high up and we can make electricity for that. One problem though, the volcanic vapor, the steam, it contains little particles and they start to crystallize, and this is a pipe from Wairaki, and after using the pipe for however long, the pipes clog up, they close, so they have to be replaced. So you have to financially invest into this in order to make it work, but as I said, it causes Iceland to be the biggest banana producer in Europe. So the energy in Iceland is very cheap, and this is because of the volcanoes delivering it. You just have to learn how to harvest. Here's an interesting phenomena. This is a volcanic crater in the Cape Verde Islands. This is a little island republic of uh, Africa. And uh, here in the Cape Verde <coughs> Islands, uh, this volcanic crater is exploited to make salt. It's close to the coast, and the rim of the crater is between the volcanic crater and the ocean. And they dug a big tunnel between the ocean and the crater. And via this lever system, they can open and shut it. So they can have seawater coming in, and then they shut it, and then they just let the seawater evaporate until they have salt. And once the salt is moved out, they open the shutter again, water comes in, and they close it again. So it's a huge salt production there. And uh, here's a few more impressions from this Salinas that I visited a few years ago. And you get the idea, you can do this in little lagoons like this as well, but with this volcanic crater, they have this large area, and it's producing most of the salt used in the Cape Verde Republic, to my understanding. So, very economically useful little situation. So, there is some potential uses of volcanoes that personally I would not recommend. And uh, mm -hmm. people have often asked, would it be possible to combat global warming by triggering volcanoes. I mentioned volcanic winters earlier, so there can be a cooling effect after large volcanic <coughs> eruptions. So we could cool the earth by <laughs> creating more volcanic eruptions, so some people argue. Personally, I'm skeptical. 
Volcanoes are complicated beasts. And ooh, once we start volcanic eruptions artificially, I don't think we have the means to stop them. And uh, also, we don't really understand the climate so well, so we don't fully understand volcanoes. So messing around with systems where we're not really on top of things, I'm not a big fan, but it's been discussed. And in theory, it might help. But we might need a few more hundred years to really be on top of this game. There has also been a speculation now whether we can prevent volcanic eruptions by drilling into volcanoes and letting them cool out more quickly. To be honest, I don't want to be a drill worker at an active volcano <laughs> and drill a hole in there. So I think it's very dangerous. So to my understanding, in my mind, at the moment, we should stay away from those things until we understand more. But it's fun to discuss these aspects. So the last point uh, I'd like to talk to you about is culture and society. Volcanoes have always been very impressive to mankind. I mentioned earlier that as a little boy I was worried about lava coming from Italy and uh, my mom explained to me that Italy is far away. So uh, I was calmed down, but if you live close to volcanoes, it will leave an impact on you. If the volcano is friendly, people often give it a father kind of figure or image, like Father Day, Tede, as people call Tede Volcano on Tenerife, because it hasn't erupted in many hundred years. If a volcano erupts very frequently, People usually consider it more dangerous, and then there's legends of devils living inside the volcano, like Merapi volcano in Indonesia. There people have realized it's not a friendly volcano, so you better associate it with something negative, so new generations will immediately realize that the volcano has dangers. So, this has led to all sorts of beliefs and legends, and uh, you might have heard about uh, Pele, she, the goddess of volcanoes and Hawaii, and if your house is affected by a lava flow, well, Pele is, is apparently not happy with you. And uh, this is a picture from the 1960s, you can tell by the glasses, I think. And uh, this was a fissure eruption, and here was a depression, and the lava was flowing into the depression, making a lava lake. So, here it became a tourist attraction, people were able to go close enough, and in order to calm the volcano, the tradition has evolved that local people throw gin bottles into the eruptive crater. <laughs> Apparently, Pelé likes gin and it calms her down. I don't know if it works, but these are beliefs that are happening. I've seen similar things in Indonesia that people throw food or money even into volcanic craters in order to calm the gods inside the volcano down. Here, um, some impression from Merapi again. There's very rich culture, very high population density around some of these volcanoes. The volcanoes are even on some of the banknotes. And uh, here, uh, a newspaper clipping from Java. Here, the fire dance. Javanese villagers attempt to appease the volcano by doing a magic dance. There was this person who inspired all of these dancers. Um, he was the guardian of Merapi volcano, and he tried to calm everybody down, saying Merapi is a friend, Merapi is not dangerous. He died in 2010 in a volcanic eruption. <laughs> so uh, it's not that easy, this concept. And uh, while we have, um, uh, while we revere volcanoes, I don't think these methods are really all that useful. Volcanoes have uh, also been uh, considered uh, magic places or even the seats of gods like sacred Mount Fuji here in some uh, watercolors or paintings from Japan and people still hike up to Mount Fuji, some even bare feet I understand and it's believed to be a spiritual journey when you go up the volcano and uh, here's another image of uh, Fuji, it's one of the nicest volcanic cones in the world. It's almost perfectly shaped. It's very impressive. And a friend of mine gave me this as a present a few months ago. And it's outside if you like to have a look. It's a fan with Mount Fuji in the middle. So it really impresses that people in the surrounding of volcanoes really live with a volcano and take it in 
If you like Japanese art, here's Hokusai, one of the uh, people who invented cartoons, so to speak. And uh, he had a whole series of volcano images going from the various angles at Mount Fuji and showing it. And he was also the person who drew the big tsunami. And of course, people in Japan have not only seen good days on volcanoes, they've also seen bad days. And uh, this is also depicted in art. Here's a big volcanic eruption. I can't read Japanese, but I don't think it sounds good. So uh, <laughs> from that point of view, this is a warning, an ancient warning about volcanic eruptions, if you will. It's like the leaflet on volcanic ash, which I had out there. This is not just true for Southeast Asia, this is also true for, for Europe. Here is an old map from uh, about Iceland, it's a Dutch map, and it goes back to, I think, the 1580s. And you see Hekla volcano here, just over here, erupting. And because Iceland is a magic, spooky place with loads of eruptions, they put all these creatures there, all these very dangerous creatures, to show that you're approaching the entrance of hell if you even go there. So this is very, very telling, I think. I personally believe that uh, volcanoes are also reflected in the Edda, the big uh, legends um, that have been summarized around about the year 1000 in Iceland. And uh, here there was a big eruption in Iceland, a fissure eruption that lasted several years. And it was probably in the year 934 AD. This was about 60 years after the first wave of settlements that is recorded in Iceland. And intriguingly, after this first wave, settlements slowed down. And we can speculate that the big eruption had a part to play. Iceland was becoming less attractive for settlers when they hear stories about big eruptions. So in the Edda, where these uh, stories about the Aesir gods are all recorded, there's also this concept of the end of days, Ragnarök, and uh, there it says in the end that there will be a winter with the greatest frost and keen winds, and the sun will do no good, there will be three of these, and indeed it's said that after the Elgio eruption there was three years of bad, devastating weather. So there is potentially a link. And it goes further. In the end, it also says, the sun will turn black and the land will sink into the sea. The brightest stars will vanish from the skies. Fire will rage forth and the flames will lick heaven itself. Boulders will slam together so big that trolls will tumble and man will tread the path to hell. I think it's a perfect description of a big volcanic eruption. <laughs> and uh, I believe some of the inspiration for the end of days has come from volcanoes. And you might say, oh, this was just the fantasy of somebody who had too much uh, ale. But uh, there's another chronicle here from northern Germany, the Saxon Chronicle, which says that in the years just before the death of King Heinrich, uh, which was actually 936, many signs occur. The mountains of the north are said to have erupted flames in many places, and the brightness of the sun itself seems to have diminished. So we have independence reference for these events round about the time of the Elgo eruptions. This was my Iceland example. And in Italy, there is a religious connotation about eruptions as well. Here you see various drawings, uh, religious drawings, um, with volcanoes in the background. I guess it's the hope that uh, religious or the belief to a higher uh, beings can help the volcano to calm down and uh, here this is a very interesting these are some pressed medallions from 1873 uh, thanks to my colleague Francis here who supplied this image and here you see if, I guess it's the Pope at the time and here is uh, St. Mary and uh, these were pressed into liquid lava so during the eruption, people would go there with their stamps and they made these things, these medallions from liquid lava, beautiful souvenirs. And here's another image from this kids' competition right from the beginning of my presentation. And this indicated leaves, believes that volcanoes have all sorts of nasty creatures underneath that really feed the eruptions. I don't know if this is true, but um, um, this is Vesuvius today. 
in an image, and here's some historical images of Vesuvius. Vesuvius has a new volcano forming inside an older crater, and uh, this is what you see here. So this is the new cone, and this is the old crater. And I'd like to kind of show you a little bit of Vesuvius through the ages uh, for the next few minutes. I should point out that it's been a very important place for volcanology as well as for European culture for various reasons. So here's another religious aspect. This artist here has uh, tried to calm the volcano down with, uh, with praying, I guess. I'm not sure it worked, but it's what people do. They associate higher powers very frequently with volcanoes. We all heard of Pompeii. Some of you might have visited it. Pompeii was completely covered with a big ash blanket and uh, pyroclastic flow deposits in uh, 79 AD. And uh, it was excavated, and you can go there nowadays, it's spectacular. And this is an artist's impression of the event, Vesuvius erupting, covering the city of Pompeii. One of the good things about this is that we actually have a unique insight into the life of the Romans, into the early civilizations of Europe, that we wouldn't have without a volcanic eruption. It just wouldn't be there anymore. So, here is the ash and pumice deposits of Pompeii, and here's a little fiat for scale. It's a big, big, massive layer, and uh, here's an old Roman road in Pompeii itself, and here you see the eruptive material. They've only partly excavated it. Here's two colleagues from Italy, and uh, you see this was completely covered. So nothing left. Indeed, as I said, the place was actually forgotten. People had no idea anymore that it existed. So. The monitoring there goes back a long time. Here, 1684, we have an eruption at Vesuvius. We have the young crater to <coughs> the right, the old crater to the left. And believe it or not, you have surely heard about Spartacus, the uh, gladiator who became a rebel. He was trying to hide with his little army from the Romans. And he was hiding right in between these two areas. He was hiding in the volcanic crater. And the Roman army was scared. They didn't go there. So this is why he went there. This was one of his strongest <coughs> tactical moves and allowed him to actually keep his rebellion up for quite a while. So here's another image, a little younger, uh, 1755. And uh, these are beautiful drawings. You can see that now science is starting to creep in. There's little labels, alpha and B and C. And uh, there's a description of the processes that are happening there. Here's another one. Again, there's labels there, one, two, three. So people were starting to be more observational rather than just being in awe about the volcanoes. They were starting to realize there's systematic changes that people can understand. So here another image, 1754. Here another one, 1776. Here a few more oil paintings from uh, the 17th and 18th century. Here the lava is starting to uh, affect the agricultural land. I showed this image earlier. This one as well. And here another one. People are starting to flock there and find the eruptions very spectacular. Now, here, color comes in. This is 1834. 1944, this was one of the last eruptions, or the last eruption at Vesuvius. It actually just happened when the Americans occupied uh, Naples. A few days after they went in, the eruption happened. So they had to deal with enemy soldiers and eruptions at the same time. And this is a more modern picture. Um, uh, sorry, this is uh, 100 years old, over 100 years old. But you see that uh, the population density is increasing. And in modern times, it has increased even more. The city is really up to the flanks. It's one of the heaviest population densities in Europe. And it sits right next to a rather dangerous volcano. But Vesuvius has become a tourist attraction already in the 1890s. There was a little cable car going up, but it was destroyed in one of the later eruptions. So today you have to walk up there. So, and 
Here is uh, an image again from the children's contest. And uh, here you see Vesuvius, <laughs> the uh, different cones, the young cone and the older one. And this person was very worried that the fragments, the fiery fragments, will spill all the way over the volcano. And I think it is partly realistic. Pompeii, uh, mentioned it before, it has uh, a huge impact on our understanding of Roman life, how the civilization in Europe evolved. And although these people suffered dreadfully, and I feel terribly affected when I see these images, we must also realize that we have learned so much. There's a Roman McDonald's. This was a little kind of kitchen area where you could just walk in and have a food and uh, these things. So we really have gained enormous understanding of how life worked back then. In addition to these things, volcanoes have, of course, inspired all sorts of thinkers. And uh, here we have Jules Verne, who wrote this journey to the center of the Earth. And he entered the center of the Earth pathway at Snæfellsjökull on Iceland, and he came out to Stromboli. So the story would imply that he traveled all the way into the Earth and came out somewhere else, and that there's a connection of all volcanoes inside the planet. I'm not sure this is true, but the idea is very nice. One of the first volcano movies I watched as a little boy was this, oops, Krakatoa, east of Java. And uh, this is a movie from the 1950s. Well, sadly, they haven't done their homework because Krakatoa is actually west of Java. But anyway, um, it's, a, it's a catastrophe movie. And um, it had big sales back in the 50s and 60s, uh, in the 60s, I believe. But uh, I watched it again a little while ago, and I didn't like it so much anymore. <laughs> There's more modern movies like Dante's Peak, maybe you've seen it. And uh, there's also Volcano, what would happen if a volcano erupts under Los Angeles? Well, it would be a big disaster, I appreciate that. You have some Hollywood actors like, uh, um, oh, I forgot his name, Tommy Lee Jones or whatever. And um, uh, of course, they make it very attractive. And uh, in these movies, people drive through lava fields and all sorts of things. You have to be a bit skeptical. But maybe you enjoy a volcano meal to go with it at the same time. So volcanoes sell to this day. And uh, just for Sophie, I made a slide. My 10-year-old my daughter is here today. Just for Sophie, I made a slide this morning. And that is uh, Disney movies. They employ volcanoes as well. Maybe you've seen this Viana movie. It's about a Polynesian girl and uh, her helper here. And uh, they are exploring the islands in the Pacific, and uh, they are facing Jakar, the lava monster. And uh, Jakar is uh, a very dangerous kind of creature, and uh, it makes these islands. And once the islands are made, they become green, like the impression up there. So what I like about this movie is that it really encapsulates the two sides of volcanoes. There's the construction, and the construction isn't always pleasant. And then there's the destruction, which we think of as a nice thing. But what actually happens is once you have a green island, erosion has started. The deconstruction of an island has started. So what the movie partly implies is that the good comes with the bad, and the bad comes with the good. And this is my true philosophy about volcanoes. So a few last slides before we close, and that is that uh, volcanoes still are very attractive for all sorts of uh, advertisement. You can have Krakatoa body scrub, you can have uh, shark pepper, and uh, all these things. This image up there is one of the first advertisements for olive oil, and uh, you see that Vesuvius stars in the olive oil advertisement. So uh, this is very, very strongly um, pronounced still today. There's even a rock and roll band called Krakatoa. I don't think they're very good, but uh, I don't know. But uh, yeah, you see, they're trying to capitalize on the concept of volcanoes. Volcanoes are still a major intellectual inspiration for us, and of course, a major challenge to understand. So here I'd like to close. I'd like to say, Thank you for your attention. It's been a great pleasure. And